listening. Get started. All right, cheers. All right, I think we're good to get started. Great. Um, nice to nice to see so many of you here. Last last event or second to last event of the day. So thank you for coming for this. Um, I'm Florence Schmitzberger. I'm from the University of Michigan. I have a fantastic crew here and a very uh, great in big effort between multiple institutions that we've been working on over the last few years. This is work we're presenting from predominantly last year uh, in a very unfortunate region, um, and I have uh, the pleasure of working with some great people on this. Um, Scott Donovan is here. He's uh, with Global Response Medicine. Um, an NGO that focuses on conflict regions and has been active uh, in these regions and was one of the first on the ground in Ukraine and uh, he's done some great work there uh, together with the rest of us. Um, Jess Patterson, who's on here, she uh, sends her apologies. She is currently uh, in Warsaw, just left Ukraine for a follow-up project, so she's unable to join us today. Um, Andrea Liner, she unfortunately missed her flight today, or the flight got canceled, so she's unable to be here. She uh, rerouted through Washington, D.C. to meet with uh, one of the members of the Ukrainian parliament for us, and uh, so just a little humble brag on that. Uh, she, uh, <laughs> she, uh, she was meeting on this and uh, was bragging about these projects, and uh, uh, then her flight got canceled, so she's unfortunately not here. We do have Sam Stringer here. Um, some of you know her. She's, this work was done mostly while she was at University of Michigan, now at Wash U St. Louis. Um, we have Jerome Lee as well here, um, who's been talking a little bit afterwards about some of the great telehealth opportunities we've been working on. I have a disclosure slide here, um, and uh, I'll, I'll get started with our learning objectives. The, the main thing we're going to talk about today is basically our implementation of um, humanitarian work in Ukraine uh, with a focus on EMS, uh, supposed to be a didactic with a uh, very strong component of um, a panel discussion. So we're looking forward to questions, easy questions only, please, today. Um, and we'll, we'll basically talk about these learning points, but really this is for the people that are interested in uh, expanding on this work, doing this kind of work. We're happy to share our lessons and really talk about these. Um, we have four learning objectives here, assessing an EMS system and looking at improvements uh, to the capabilities and capacities, looking at treatment and transport protocols, which is a pain in, uh, you know, in our counties and states, and even bigger pain if you're combining multiple um, municipalities, countries, and uh, a war conflict, um, being able to select the right personnel, uh, and also looking at telemedicine in the support of disaster and humanitarian setting. So I'll hand it over uh, to Scott here to talk a little bit about um, the work in Ukraine, humanitarian work in general that's been ongoing for the last year. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here for the last one of the day. Um, again, my name is Scott Donovan. I'm the medical director for Global Response Medicine. Um, what I want to do is to let you all know this is in keeping with that first goal. The first thing was ground context. We needed to do an assessment, and this came about by Ukrainian Ministry of Health and Ministry of Defense reaching out to the WHO. WHO reached out to us because of some prior work in places, particularly our work in Sierra Leone and Iraq. So it was to do an assessment of the ground context. Then over on the right, the system knowledge and resources. The idea was we can't just take our stuff in there. We have to see what things are in place, do an assessment of theirs. And for those of you who have done assessments of your own EMS areas, Imagine, you know, you're not in your county, you're in a completely different sort of context. And then to apply the processes there on the left of evidence-based medicine. Our group is primarily one-third academic emergency medicine, one-third EMS, and one-third military, primarily special operations forces. And so it's to take those groups and then to be sure that we are assessing what's going on and then to implement evidence-based medicine to make things better with it. We have, after the initial assessment, a rapid response team that goes in. We were first notified on January 6th. The invasion occurred on February 24th. Uh, we actually first heard about stuff at the end of 2021 uh, when they started with uh, Russian troop buildups in Belarus. So some eight weeks prior to the invasion on February 24th, uh, we got the word for a heads up. Um, Florian was actually uh, one of the first ones in there, he and I went in with the first team assessment uh, following that. The initial idea is it, is it follows on there. 
uh, was to do a rapid response team initiative, take a look at what was going to be needed, um, implement those, and then once that was complete, then to go back and do a reassessment, and that's the further action required or requested. Do we need to do ongoing things? If so, is it more long-term clinical care? Is it more academic capacity building? Our first line with what we were doing was multifactorial. It was to do uh, emergency medicine and surgery there, along with the assessment, and then see what long-term things need to be done. Our team was made up of primarily five people. We wanted to keep it five because that way you could still kind of squeeze into one vehicle if you had to make rapid egress getting out of there. Typically, it's a special operations force medic. They serve as both security and medic. For those of you who've been able to work with them, they may be, you know, we have one guy who's a, a SEAL Team 7 medic, formerly a lot of uh, Ranger Regiment, 18, uh, Ranger Regiment medics, 18 Deltas, 18 Echoes, um, and we as emergency physicians like to believe that we are this sort of, you know, jack of all trades, perhaps master of none, but we've got every sort of, you know, we have to know our stuff plus the, the next step of the next specialty. And just about time that you think you are the well-rounded group within medicine, you are until you meet an 18 Delta. And then you realize like, we don't have that. They can serve as first assistant surgery, anesthetists, anesthesiologists, nurses, medics, etc. cetera. Um, absolutely amazing. So the team was made up of an emergency physician, a general surgeon, hopefully trauma surgeon, um, an SF medic, uh, an interpreter, um, who hopefully, along with speaking English for us, also spoke, hopefully, Russian and Ukrainian. We had multiple forward locations over the course of five months. The first two rotations were at civilian hospitals. That was the first place that we were, quote, allowed to go to. Um, following that, they said, would you please come help in the military hospitals? So we rotated out of there um, into the military hospitals because basically at that point there was very little difference. The civilian hospitals were seeing civilian military wounded. The military hospitals were as well. Um, you're already aware that this is not a war where it's basically soldier on soldier. This is indiscriminate shooting and bombing of, it's, it's absolutely tragic. Civilians that would just be walking down the street trying to get food and it serves like an arcade game for some of this. There were 724 surgeries that were done. Simultaneously, along with doing this, there was educations being performed both in the hospital and with EMS, both TCCC, um, along with education for hopefully knock on wood, something that will still, uh, hasn't happened yet and hopefully won't, but for chemical, biological, radiology, uh, radiological and nuclear weapons. Doing education for the medical personnel from the major hospitals, initially civilian, later uh, military hospitals also. The territorial defense, which is basically a volunteer system, it's a civilian system uh, that was set up to supplement the military aspect of it. Uh, the police and other EMS, and there were about 1,800 people trained in this, and it was a combination again of TCCC. One of the differences in TCCC, and to follow that versus TECC, there are several differences with it, but one of the main ones is that TCCC is set up for those primarily between the ages of 18 and 35 because it's primarily combat. And unfortunately, um, 18 to 35 was not the limitation, the age group that was, that was often injured. With some of this, the, the main injuries that we saw, and Florian will talk about this later, and just some of the things that occurred, uh, the, the disproportionate number of it, although it was penetrating trauma, you also had the unfortunate uh, addition of blast trauma because most of this was not from arms fire. Certainly, we often refer to things as small arms fire. Um, I will tell you that uh, AK shoots 7.62 rounds, and there's nothing small arms about a 7.62 round. Um, you don't do the vascular evaluation that you're used to doing here in the States. Uh, for the three weeks or so that I was there, and I'm not sure if Florian there because we, we overlap in the same place, uh, I don't ever remember us using the CAT scan. So um, yeah, it just doesn't really work. So you're not getting your vascular studies and things like that. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of amputation parts with it. Uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of emphasis, as Florian will discuss, uh, there were problems that occurred in that although the, you've got the issues of being in the hospital with not only no potable water, but no water. They shut off the infrastructure, so there's no water coming in. It's not like you get it, turn on the faucet and boil it. There was no water. 
period. They had to bring it in from a lake in buckets and we had to filter it. No electricity, no heat in March and April, uh, windows shot out. Um, so you've got those issues. There's also a lack of awareness about aggressive resuscitation before the OR. So there were a lot of people who, and eh, the tourniquet's not on too well, but that's okay, they're going to the OR. Uh, you know, they'll get pain meds when they get to the OR. Yeah, we'll do some resuscitation when we get to the OR. And so trying to educate that, and there were at least six arrests that occurred during induction of anesthesia because they were not adequately resuscitated. Um, and it wasn't until we were leaving that uh, after a couple of months that they were like, hey, you remember how you guys were trying to talk to us about that? Um, can you maybe kind of let us know? We were in Mykolaiv in the southeast portion, right between Maripol that you've heard about in Odessa. And that was right after Mykolaiv sent the last missile to sink the Moskova, uh, their, you know, their Hallmark battleship. And so at that point, uh, we're like, no, we can't stay because this whole city just became a target. So um, we were able to get some of the teaching points across, but unfortunately, perhaps not until too late. So I think the, uh, you, you gave a great overview of the hospital-based care that happens in the uh, more frontline hospitals and kind of the, the lack of resuscitation, the initial like desperate attempts at stabilizing the patients. And that's, they're doing a great job at it, big picture, right? The overwhelmed system and clinicians that haven't left their hospital since the beginning of the war, like literally like a year on out, there's people that live in the hospital and they just never leave. Um, the emotional and psychological toll of that I can't even begin to comprehend. So they try, they try to implement all these teaching points and one of the ways that the international and their national community has come together is trying to offload some of their burden um, in a sense of moving their patients after damage control resuscitation, which is the EM domain that they're trying to build up, and damage control surgery, which they're trying to like initiate um, as close as possible to the point of injury, and actually move those patients towards the western area. The, the country of Ukraine right now is, is a very interesting place. Um, the western and central regions are perfectly normal for, most, for the most part. There is a psychological component of everybody being stressed about the war, knowing somebody who's, who's off fighting, but you can have a spa weekend in central Lviv and a beautiful vacation and get married and have a wonderful time with the war ongoing. So you have a functionally intact country and a few hundred uh, miles to the east, you have a complete war zone with no infrastructure and crumbling uh, healthcare infrastructure and uh, really a huge humanitarian need. So one of the things they're trying to do is actually move patients from the east towards the west of the country, but also internationally. Um, I'm very proud of the international community for coming together and actually providing a ton of care for patients outside the country. There's an enormous amount of resources being spent and a lot of goodwill in many countries all over the globe taking in patients. One of the comp difficult things with this is how do you actually move those patients um, in the country and then outside the country. So the WHO allocated some funds and said, hey, easy problem, right? Just like get some ambulances and just move these patients, right? Not, it's not, not rocket science, right? Um, those of us who are involved and all of us are involved in EMS to some degree understand the difficulties with that and it's not that easy. The uh, imagine trying to uh, set up a tra multiple transfers within your state um, and coordinating between different transporting units, different agencies, different levels of care, and now different countries. And now add on to that that military-aged men who generally staff these ambulances can't leave the country. So you have a, a very, very difficult problem from a logistics standpoint. Um, add on to that a huge acuity in, the, in those patients, um, them really being extremely sick and needing critical care transport, which, you know, we, we uh, saw COVID, how it overwhelmed our system, and those of us who work in uh, resource-limited settings, um, a lot of respect for people who work in very remote settings that need to transfer sick patients, like, that is an ongoing challenge here. It's multiplied there by a factor of 100 because they just can't get rid of their patients that are very sick. So the WHO basically set up this overarching goal of like transporting patients 
out of the country and uh, negotiated with multiple um, NGOs and state players and trying to like set up how to move patients safely and uh, adequately outside of the country or towards Western Ukraine. Our, our part, I'll, I'll say our, there's a lot of people involved and a lot of great people that have done effort into this. It's very small. Um, we set up two transporting um, regions, Western and Eastern Ukraine, over five months. We nearly got eight transports, which doesn't sound like much, but they were mostly critical care transports with a lot of efforts involved in that. And I'll, I'll share some of the lessons that we've learned from this in case people would like to like, replicate this in an, another unfortunate setting. So the first thing I want to talk about is assessing the EMS system to identify the improvements. So a little, little bit of background. This is an example. I, I took a screenshot of some of our run sheets. Um, chief complaint, basically. Like, those are the types of transports. And uh, the, first, the first teaching point here is a lot of this looks exactly what you'd expect, right? All right, cool. So we have TBI, we have GSW, we have fractures. Then we have dementia, encephalopathy, skin lesions. So um, that sounds like your normal uh, skilled nursing facility move, right? Um, I, one of the key, key takeaways here is that like EMS still remains EMS, and normal, normal problems still happen. Um, I, I vividly remember taking care of a polytrauma patient and having to like hear from the next room over people fighting with the acutely psychotic patient who was also drunk, which is something that we all experience in our clinical practice. And it's a big lesson to like not get too, too focused on the, the apparent problem at, at hand, but also be like, well, this is still an EMS system that needs to function in the big picture. We can't take away all the resources because they still have normal medical and other emergencies as well. So these are the types of patients we, we transported. Um, we had, uh, we were lucky enough to have uh, adequate uh, medications for the most part. And uh, here, here's another challenge, like when you design uh, protocols, when you design um, any kind of EMS system, what's available for the medics? What's available in the hospitals? How do you deal with drug shortages, which is something that we're all dealing with right now in the States as well? Um, how do you read Cyrillic? Um, that's a little challenging as well. So we, we had a lot of like, a lot of our providers were on the ambulance using Google Translate, trying to like figure out what this ampule does before, and like making little labels. Um, so quality quality insurance in that is hugely important. If you if you mess up the dosing, if you mess up the uh, the medication name, that's a huge problem. So yet another very very difficult thing. And internationally, different different locations use different medications that are very similar. But I mean, just think think about like your favorite induction drug, and like go to a different location. Other other places use different medications, and it's it's very different. You, you don't have the, the facility with those medications, so you uh, something to keep in mind when you write protocols and you, uh, you deal with that. And then the, the probably most difficult aspect is integrating into the response system. That, that was our biggest challenge, and we were lucky enough to have very reasonable players to work with. Um, but here, here's, the, here's the, the part, if you ever find yourself in a situation like this, um, this is very similar to a mass casualty incident. The logistics are huge. Um, spending the time wisely to interact with other agencies, having a clear command structure, um, was the absolute most important thing. We had, this kind of work draws a very interesting crowd of people, no offense guys, um, but like it, it has a lot of people that want to do stuff, that are ready to go and that are ready to like get into the battle and just go and do things. Uh, we see this in a lot of us, a lot of our colleagues in emergency medicine, it's, it's a characteristic we sometimes have, um, but taking a step back to actually integrate yourself properly is very important. Imagine if somebody showed up in your hospital and said, hey, you guys have a big boarding problem, I can just take care of some of your patients, I'm gonna do a better job than you at this, that's not gonna go well with you. Um, so keep in mind, one of the things we had to work with with our personnel and ourselves is how do we, how do we elegantly and like, how do, how do we bring the point across that we're here to supplement, not, uh, not take over any of these, any of these systems? Because that's that was certainly a lot of a lot of conflict, uh, at least in theory. 
Um, we, we ended up working together with multiple great organizations, um, working with existing infrastructure, which was in a country very fragmented. So imagine like in probably your counties and states, multiple EMS agencies that are not working together all that well or you know, come and go and having to work with them, having a centralized dispatch, having open channels of communication, and then uh, people wanting to get the interesting transports or people don't want to go to these locations, other people want to go to those locations. Uh, make sure if you, if you ever find yourself in a position like that, dedicate the manpower uh, to actually resolving these issues beforehand because that was certainly something we found and was very, very challenging. Hi everyone. Um, for our uh, second learning objective, um, so we're going to talk about um, developing treatment and transport protocols for exceptional situations. Um, and as you've heard, um, this is all a big exceptional situation. Um, and so you have, you know, you have people kind of with different credentialing um, that are you know, coming to Ukraine um, and from different backgrounds, could be from different countries, um, and then trying to marry that with. Uh, you know, you are you know in a different country that has different kind of practice patterns and um, and resources, and so taking all of that into consideration um, when making these protocols, um, and so really before even getting into you know medical protocols, um, kind of a general treatment one that um, kind of has these principles, and um, you can you can read this, but the the summary is that you know we will stick to you know the scope of practice um, that they're credentialed to do, um, kind of use general EMS principles um, as they're trained to do, and then use online medical, medical control. And the part of this um, that we really want to focus on is um, scope of practice. Um, and so, again, because of kind of this exceptional situation, um, specifically using some guiding principles um, that are outlined in this general treatment protocol, um, and so baseline scope of practice, having resources and references, and then again, online medical control. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, two of these. And so as far as baseline scope, again, this is a simple concept, but so important, um, is that kind of any of the clinicians um, working um, are restricted to kind of their practice at their level of training and current role. Because um, you know, the last thing that we want is for it to you know, look like and we're going to a different country, to Ukraine here, and just kind of going, going rogue on our medicine. Um, and so really sticking to this is important. Um, and as far as kind of, there's some examples of, um, of protocols here. And in these is kind of different levels of intervention. Um, again, that um, kind of addresses that there's different um, kind of credentialed um, people that are working underneath these protocols. Uh, and Florian kind of talked about this a little bit, but then going back to trying to kind of marry the fact that you're in a, a different different country, different resources. Um, you know, if you have critical care transport um, that's on vasopressors, and you know someone usually uses norepinephrine, um, and all of a sudden all they have is kind of dopamine, and maybe it's a, maybe it's in a different language. And so trying to be, you know, as uh, kind of give different options and kind of be as specific um, in the protocols um, that that you can. And then um, lastly, online medical control, um, another kind of even more, more important in this setting. Um, and so making sure that it's 24-7, um, maybe multiple people um, online medical control, um, kind of accounting for you know, different, different time zones. Um, again, maybe you know, it's hard to, hard to reach, reach someone for a certain reason. Um, and also having those people kind of provide multiple options, maybe not knowing what exactly the circumstances that they are, um, that the crew is practicing in. The, the second to last learning point really is the, the personnel management stuff. And that's something that all of us, all of us have dealt with in the emergency department. Um, Personalities are very strong. Um, they have different backgrounds, and how do you reconcile that in a in a foreign country? You have basic life support, you have advanced life support, you have critical care transport um, trained personnel, um, you have a physician-based system in Ukraine that's now transitioning to a um, to a, a paramedic type system. 
um, which, which posed extreme challenges, like who's allowed to do what? Uh, can you even continue on this like medication? Who can start medications? Um, the, the point I want to really get into, because this is very specific, and if you ever find yourself in a situation like this, you'll have to deal with this no matter what. The, the personality and the personnel selection really, I think, is the, is the key point. Um, we had um, very interesting people apply to do this job. Um, the volunteers that jump to this are an interesting bunch, and all of them are motivated. Not all of them are suitable for this type of work, um, and that's our responsibility as the physician on the team to really assess as well, um, because ultimately you, you carry the responsibility for, for the medical operations. Um, we had uh, one person say to us, all right, we have this Medevac West and Medevac East, and everybody wanted to be in Medevac East, because you want to go to the, the cool places, right? You want to be near the front line and transport the sickest patients, and then come back and take some cool selfies and uh, send them for them on Instagram. And uh, we, we really, the, the need was the strongest for Medivac Fest, actually. And uh, the people that were like pushing for the Eastern Party, it was, a, it was honestly not a very successful program in the East because the need was not there. Um, and uh, the, the local infrastructure, they, Ukrainians are very resourceful and they had set that up and they took great care of that. Um, I, I remember one guy coming up and being like, you know what, we need to go east because we can really show them what we're made of. And that is a huge red flag. Uh, those, that kind of thinking uh, it, like, sinks an entire operation. Like one rogue player can really derail an entire system and um, has done so at multiple locations um, in, in Ukraine by like rogue players like not doing well and overstepping the boundaries. and. Uh, this is where we have the responsibility as the medical uh, control for this to like make sure you select the right people and stay within reason for all of this. Um, there's different responsibilities. You need to like make sure you have the safety of the team and the patient in mind. Um, so you're responsible for like patient safety, but you also need to plan for contingencies. Um, so you have the right people, you have the right location, you have the logistics set up. Now you really need to have a very strong um, plan for all kind of eventualities. I, I wrote some stuff down there. I, I won't bother reading it all off here. You can do that um, as well. But really, the, the key thing is always having multiple plans and being prepared for these things, because some of them will happen, and being being ready for them is is absolutely important. So we had extensive safety plans um, for individuals, for our vehicles, our uh, insurance, and everything else. We had numerous, uh, we have personnel dedicated to uh, the safety aspect of this. So all the operations have dedicated safety personnel who have a background in this and do this full time for our operations. And that's something to really not, you shouldn't skimp on that. That's like the most important aspect because again, one incident will, will cause your whole operation to fall uh, and stop. And you really, you really can't afford that because in the end, don't get hurt yourself because if you do, um, the entire operation is gone and you won't be able to help anybody else anymore. So we had contingency plans, medical plans, all, all, these, uh, all, all these important tasks were defined beforehand. And really having constant security assessments and reassessments is like the absolute most important part. Being able to like be certain that you're staying away from any kind of trouble, being safe in what you're doing and having uh, real good contingency planning in case uh, your assessment was not correct. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, for the last section, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've sort of done with um, digital health telemedicine to support uh, Ukraine. And this is all through the work of an NGO called Health Tech Without Borders that a few of us co-founded, um, where I'm gonna focus on sort of three pillars. First is our telemed component, then the virtual education component that we've worked on, and also this last component of sort of building out the digital healthcare system and digital ecosystem for a better humanitarian response. It's funny though, I'll say that, you know, pre-COVID, I was one of those docs that didn't really believe in telemed. And now I'm running a telemed group, right? But it's, it's like one of those things that was shiny, the tech was there, I just didn't want to do it for all the reasons, right? I'm EM critical care, and so a lot of it flowed through our ICUs, but it was still one of those things that I just, 
wasn't really sold on until COVID, right? And then we did so much telemed during COVID that that was one of the silver linings with COVID that it shows that it works and it works well for the right use cases. But we have to be careful and use it in the right use cases. So, um, so I'm representing Health Tech Without Borders here as a co-founder. It was one of my disclosures, uh, but just for full disclosure. So after the initial war started, right, in February of last year, um, a group of us got together and realized that they probably will, are going to need help. The healthcare system probably will not be fully intact to the point where uh, there's some help that we could probably deliver remotely through telemedicine. We didn't know if it was going to work or not, but we were going to try, right? And so it's kind of nice. I think you've heard sort of this running thread that it was nice to sort of see the global community come together around this, where we had a call to action and we put it out for both tech companies and clinicians to come forward and volunteer their time and in-kind support of their technology to do something within Ukraine to support the population. And it's pretty great to see where we had 40 plus tech companies come forward that offered their technology all pro bono, plus their programming time, of course, and server times. And then we had over 800 clinicians from 20 countries that all volunteered, right? And the great part, too, is that, unfortunately, you know, a lot of us and a lot of folks cannot go physically into Ukraine, but there's still ways, other ways to help. And so from, you know, your office or as a clinician, you could spend two hours a week and be able to still help out in some way. So it was a mad scramble of working through the tech companies, figuring out what use cases would be best for these tech companies. If you can imagine, a lot of them just didn't work well in the environment that we needed them to, right? And so we ended up going live with three, uh, two EU-based pretty big uh, te telehealth companies and one pre-war Ukrainian telemed company that turned pro bono with us uh, with the war. And so I'm happy to report that by, you know, since the start of the war, we've already done about 100,000 consults uh, to Ukrainians and refugees within the country. It's all primary care related. And we're really down to only one telemed company. And it's one of the lessons that we learned is even though the two other European EU-based telemed companies were probably more robust in terms of technology, they just didn't get too many patients. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? They weren't known. It probably wasn't really built properly for what they needed to do. And People just didn't know them and probably didn't trust it with um, all the things that were happening within Ukraine. And so the one that was most active, of course, is the telemed group called Doctor Online that was already active there and people already knew them and so it's trusted them in so many ways. And so um, it, well, our whole process, we did document well. We're hoping that it can be used in other humanitarian crises in the future. So if you guys get bored, we did publish it in New England Journal Catalyst. You can sort of see uh, a lot of what we took care of was really all general care. It was all primary care. The stories we got were really about like, you know, families that couldn't really access the healthcare system for some reason, but had like their two-year-old with a fever, but just needed some warm contact with a provider or clinician so they could figure out what to do next. Is it important enough to take that step to go to the hospital or find a healthcare point of contact or something else, right? But it was really all primary care, right? We weren't involved in the trauma and everything else in the hospital level, of course, since uh, we were all really taking care of the populace instead. Um, a lot of pediatrics, some OB, but really a lot of just general care, preventative care questions that people had and needed access. So we also um, started doing more peer-to-peer -peer consults and sort of got involved in different groups. And one big one was around rehab medicine, where we started working with the WHO cluster on rehabilitation medicine because we heard clearly that the rehab system within Ukraine for the war casualties, the amputees, the TBIs, wasn't as robust as other places. And of course, the US and the European Union hospitals probably couldn't absorb and will help and take some, right? We took some even at my hospital, at Mass General, took a few. But it's not, you know, it's like a handful at best. And so there was this, this huge need for re developing and capacity building of rehab medicine within the country. So we helped run a lecture series, all online. If you guys ever get bored, you're welcome to watch all the lectures. It's about 17 lectures from pediatric amputees all the way to traumatic brain injury. Uh, we got faculty from across the world, right? And so it wasn't just our faculty, but there's multiple faculty from different rehab centers across the world, from Israel to United States to different places within the EU. Um, that have given amazing lectures uh, to sort of uh, work through it. But the other big program we realized is mental health, that we had to support through digital health. 
Um, we took a different stance, though. So we spoke with some of the European-based mental health groups that were turned on a tele-mental health system in Ukraine, right? So that they can support the populace as well with whatever they need. Since I think the mental health needs, everyone sort of understood that it's gonna be huge, especially as this continued. Um, what we heard was the volume wasn't that high, probably because of what I talked about before was there probably was some distrust in technology, the system not really knowing who's on the other side, right? Um, and it's all new tech and new apps to download which can be scary, especially in a, the wrong environment. But for us, so what we did decided to focus on was we wanted to support the mental health specialists within Ukraine to continue doing the work they need, right? And so we called it the Helping Healers Heal program, where we have our social workers, mental health specialists within the US who speak the language, have been doing essentially one-on-one -on -one and group sessions with a cohort of mental health specialists within Ukraine so that they can continue seeing the patients they see. And also, we're a resource for what they need, right? So we've heard that, for example, a lot of them have never taken care of pediatric patients who need some type of mental health support. And there's a lot of that now. And so we were able to sort of bring together resources and share that with them virtually as well. But the biggest component from what we've heard from them is really about how they need support. And we know that from COVID, right? We all need support as clinicians so that they can continue hearing the horrible stories. There's no outlet for them. So we became that outlet in so many ways. And a lot of them said that they probably would have quit and stopped taking on patients as Ukrainians within Ukraine, right? Um, unless without our program, 3H. Uh, so in terms of the ecosystem, you know, we started thinking about what other technologies we can leverage to support Ukraine and not just Ukraine, but also other humanitarian disasters around the world. So one is one of our partners is Microsoft. Um, I don't work for Microsoft, there, but it's <laughs> so, this is the HoloLens, if you guys haven't seen it. It's an augmented reality helmet that you can sort of see, and the surgeons have been using it for years, right? You can sort of beam yourself into an OR room somewhere else and watch the other surgeon and their hands and sort of you know, give them advice in real time by drawing on the screen or whatever it is that they can support each other remotely, right? So that makes a lot of sense, and a lot of that's being done by our surgical colleagues. So we decided, you know, with the rehab medicine work, it's pretty high touch, right? It's physical therapy, occupational therapy, amputees walking to figure out the prosthetics are correct, right? And so we've been testing this now. We haven't used it yet, but we have two devices at our rehab hospital in Boston right now, testing it with our MIT colleagues to see if this is feasible. Um, we're, we're doing regular rounds with patients in Ukraine via Zoom right now, but I think we're gonna try to use something like this to make it more high fidelity. Uh, the cool part, too, is our MIT colleagues, of course, are reprogramming one of these hollow lenses that they have. And they're able to track how someone, if you just have watched someone with this walking down the hallway, they could see all the points of movement and sort of see if that prosthetic is working correctly or how you can redesign that prosthetic to make it better. The other thing we've been working on is sort of chatbots. So interestingly, we started this about eight months ago, well, six months ago before ChatCPT started. Right, so what we created was a dumb bot. It has, it's not <laughs> smart at all. And so, um, in many ways, we didn't want it to be, right? So we loaded it up with Stop the Bleed and TCCC uh, to sort of teach folks uh, whatever they need within, right? And so we finally got it to a point where we can now, we put it into Ukraine about a week ago and it's now live. It is only available in Ukraine. It's available both in English and Ukrainian. And we started thinking about what the next generation is, and we will probably use generative AI and all the chat CPT type you know, um, frameworks to build a better AI that would be a little more interesting in the future. And I think that's all I have. Thank you, guys. I think we have a few minutes for questions, so that's, that's the important part. If anyone has any questions, please. Or we can go home, that's fine too. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you guys had a lot of limitations in personnel with things like this for transport. Did you help, or was there any like expansion of the protocols and like scope for paramedics or whoever was like functioning as the transporting providers to like allow kind of a little more flexibility with who's able to do what? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Sam kind of alluded to that before as well in terms of like the, the different scope of practice. We, 
what we basically did is like a hard ceiling of what is your home scope of practice. Do not ex exceed that under any circumstances. We uh, <clears throat> we never got to the point of like using <clears throat> any of your, your fancy like <clears throat> telemedicine components for like uh, medical control, but we. We did have a dumb, like, be able to call us, use satellite phones and all that for online medical control um, in order to resolve any kind of problems with that. Protocols were kind of tiered uh, based on, like, minimum standards. Um, we never sent, like, basic life support on critical care transports, for example. The, the other difficulty really was you have different countries as well. So you have, like, somebody uh, from Europe and somebody from the U.S. coming in trying to do... Uh, medicine together. It's the same medicine, broadly speaking, but they'll be like, no, we use this presser, no, we use this one. Like, are you stupid? No. Um, and it, 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 it causes conflict, and like that's where the protocol development was important to like de-conflict that and fall back to local protocols. Um, can't make people angry by using protocols that are not in the local standards, right? Um, those of us in EMS, like we know when you have transports through a different state, that turns a little interesting as well, right? Um, so th th those are the types of problems we dealt with, and we definitely tried to adjust based on the like competency level of the of the providers on the on the rigs. Excuse me, folks. We are streaming this session. If you could use the aisle mic for your questions, we would appreciate that. Thank you. For the education and some of the training that you guys provided to the providers on the ground, did you guys have a prescribed thing that you guys were going to bring to teach them, or was it more so I'm going to bring the expertise that we have and try to optimize the care that you have with the resources that you have on the ground there? So we, I don't know if this is on, this is good. So we typically follow TCCC, ATLS. Um, to a great degree, even though you're in the hospital, we even had uh, the format and the curriculum that was already present from Stop the Bleed. So we, we had our, um, both the well-known standard uh, studies such as those and the, the curriculum in those, as well as those that we bring to our, from our different institutions, uh, whether it was, you know, Harvard, Michigan, Temple, wherever, um, and we took those in there as well. I think part of it was, when we talked about selecting appropriate personnel, um, part of this, uh, I think even a bigger part, is selecting the appropriate personnel personality. And you have to mesh into their system. And I don't care how strong you are clinically, if, if you're putting off the host country, you're putting off the host hospital, you're not going to get anything done. And you're really just burning bridges. So a big part of that was to, was to integrate in and win the hearts and minds. And to that end, it, you know, they'd had a lot of trauma occur, not just within the country, but you know, to their society, to their persona. And um, they were a little bit hesitant to take on some outsiders to do things. And it wasn't until after you won the hearts and minds that they were like, hey, by the way, that stuff that you were talking about, we're kind of ready. You know, the, the, there's an old saying that you know, when, the, when the student's finally ready, the teacher will appear. And they weren't ready for some of that until after we won the hearts and minds, and that took some time. And you know, if you've got the personalities that aren't right for that, it's just going to throw more roadblocks into it. So I think that's a big part. But we did follow those things that were already established, and then brought in our own from our own institutions. It's Christine Brand from University of Michigan. Um, speaking of meshing, can you talk to how you guys troubleshooted intercontinental interagency ICS structure creation? Yeah, we can give another 50-minute lecture on that. <laughs> it, it, it honestly is was one of the most challenging aspects, and it was a um, lot of time spent before the transports actually happened to uh, to make that to make that work. So we we basically had all of this was under the auspices of the Ministry of Health uh, in Ukraine. So that was the that was nothing went without their approval. Um, so we had to make sure that we really followed their command structure and they told us exactly what would happen on each level. It was up to the different NGOs to establish um, dispatch and uh, different organizations with the uh, WHO helping in terms of uh, providing frameworks for that. 
it was uh, very much an impromptu kind of effort uh, with many meetings and uh, making sure that all are involved. The, the slight benefit was that this was transport and not scene response, uh, which helped in terms of the decreased chaos. If two ambulances would show up for the same patient, it wasn't the end of the world. But um, that's, why, that's why we had spent a lot of time in the beginning to deconflict that and actually talk. Ministry of Health says, you guys are doing this task, transporting patients. Um, and we split up internally. This organization is going to focus on this batch. This organization is going to focus on these transports. And constant reevaluation, constant talking. Um, I wish it was a more defined command structure, like ICS level kind of uh, thinking. It was not generally, but we, we worked hard on this. And uh, we had great organizations to work with as well. Thanks for your question, Dr. Brent. Thank you for the presentation. Adam Levine from Brown University. I was at uh, the UN Humanitarian Networks and Partnerships Week in Geneva recently, and WHO did a big presentation on their emergency medical team initiative and the rollout of it actually around medical transport in Ukraine. And I'm wondering what your perspective was on how well that worked in terms of coordinating uh, medical transports and also just uh, general uh, medical response from multiple different teams around the world coming in. It, it's certainly something, uh, thank you for the question. Um, the EMT, uh, the Emergency Medical Team pro Project by the WHO is something that they're trying to stand up right now in terms of increased importance of let's not all just rush in and uh, have, a, have a good time. Um, that's not how a humanitarian response should work. And uh, having one of the big players in the field trying to like provide a structure to that it is essential in my mind. Um, I, there's so many people, organizations that are just interested in helping with big quotation marks and best intentions, but it doesn't help if you're not trying to integrate and play, play nice in the, in the sandbox with the other kids. And uh, this is one of those frameworks that I think is absolutely essential and will be even more important in the future. There's uh, multiple guidebooks coming out by the WHO that we're involved in that like trying to like move in the right direction for these responses. Because otherwise, it's just uh, it's just chaos and doesn't really help if you don't actually think about how to actually logistically approach this properly. And a lot of wasted effort, a ton of money gets gets wasted on things. It's it's crazy. All right. Well, I think I think we're exactly at the time. So thank you so much for your time and patience.